Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm speaking with Benjamin Allery, co-founder and CEO of Blue Jay Legal, which focuses on machine learning and artificial intelligence. With a background in economics and law from the University of Toronto and Yale Law School, Benjamin's the Osler's Chair of Business Law at the University of Toronto, a former clerk with the Supreme Court of Canada, and an expert and author in the field of tax law. Ben and I met last year and had a fantastic discussion on artificial intelligence, and I ask that he join us today to continue that discussion with our Tax Notes listeners. Benjamin, I'd like to thank you for joining us and uh, ask you how you are today. Well, I'm great, Ben. Uh, thanks so much for having me in on this uh, Willis Ways In uh, podcast, videocast, whatever we're calling it these days. And and I understand it's your birthday today, so happy birthday! I feel uh, you know really privileged to to be on the show, and also you know for it to be your birthday, it's a uh, it's it's a great moment in time. So I'm happy to participate in this. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Uh, today is my birthday, so uh, I feel like that was my my hook in getting you to join us today on the show. So uh, again, it's it's great to have you. We, we've got a, a couple anniversaries. This is uh, Tax Analyst fiftieth uh, anniversary, and if I recall, uh, uh, your organization actually has an anniversary coming up, or or that just recently passed. Is that right? Yeah, just a couple of days ago, Blue Jay Legal celebrated its fifth anniversary as a as a startup company. So, you know, the first five years of a startup are the most fragile, the most delicate, uh, and and so it's uh, it's it's pretty great to to have that under our belts. Like the the company is now uh, definitely a, kind of in kindergarten range rather than you know at the at the toddler stage. So I'm thrilled about that. Fifty years for tax analysts. That's uh, that's you know middle age now for sure. Yeah, we're really proud of it. Uh, I think we've we've got a a, a lot going on, um, and we've certainly done a lot over fifty years, including uh, bringing uh, our listeners uh, cutting edge information that they might not otherwise uh, be able to get, uh, including this discussion with you. And so, hopefully, we'll enlighten our listeners today with a good discussion about uh, the the uh, role of artificial intelligence in tax law and uh, and law generally. So. Uh, it should be fun. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. I'm, I'm, I've been looking forward to this ever since you asked me on, so I'm pretty keen to get going. Okay. Well, uh, would you mind telling me a little bit about yourself and, and how you got uh, involved in, in this area? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I'm really, uh, you know, congenitally uh, academic in nature. Uh, so I've been a law professor at the University of Toronto since I finished my graduate work at Yale Law School uh, a long time ago. Uh, now uh, I went I went from from grad school at Yale to the clerkship uh, at the Supreme Court of Canada, and then I, I I got a tenure track job teaching at the University of Toronto. And since 2004, I've been uh, a full time tax prof there, uh, and and doing a bunch of of research, really drawing on a lot of the tools that that I've acquired. Um, through my my graduate training in economics, so quantitative methods have been kind of core to my academic research, and so it's been totally interesting to follow the development of quantitative methods in the social sciences uh, since 2004 up till now. Of course, the big developments relate to machine learning, artificial intelligence, using different quantitative computer-based methodologies. Uh, to make sense out of uh, phenomena. And, and the phenomena that we find ourselves really focusing on now is using machine learning to understand how, how courts are making decisions, how tax administrations are making decisions, and using that in, in the tax field. And that's been a natural sort of segue from uh, you know, the very ivory tower kind of academic research uh, that I did um, at the beginning of my career and, and now gravitating more and more into um, this really applied research into how can we use machine learning to predict uh, tax outcomes, predict legal outcomes. And, and it's been really, really interesting. And of course, it, it was that academic preparation and my academic interest in machine learning uh, as, a, as a tool to figure stuff out about how the tax system is operating, how tax law is operating that led to uh, the forming of of Blue Jay Legal and it and the company actually kind of started as a university class actually back in in 2015 uh, with some of my colleagues uh, at the university 
as an academic project to see if just how predictable can we make law using uh, machine learning. And so very much rooted in, in academia. And I, I still, as you mentioned at the outset, um, am at the university and, and I'm at an active faculty member in addition to uh, the work with uh, the startup. And so it's, uh, it's, I, I kind of have this twin existence as as someone who's you know very much deeply interested in the academic roots of of this, but also interested in the application in in, in tax administration, tax compliance, uh, and tax law generally, tax accounting. So uh, I, I kind of I've got a presence in in both spheres at the moment. That's very interesting. Um, especially coming from an academic background and, and viewing it through that lens and, and seeing how your students are best capable of learning information. It, it brings me to think of just the general question of how, how is machine learning helping with prediction and, and, and how, how does machine learning and artificial intelligence just work generally in this area? Right. So, you know, Using using terms like machine learning and artificial intelligence, it, it can often be uh, a convenient shorthand, but it can also be obfuscating. People will people will say, "Well, what is it that you're actually referring to when you say machine learning or artificial intelligence?" And so, I, I think it's a a terrific question. What I can tell you is about some of some of the the kind of assumptions that we're bringing to bear on it in in the academic work and in the the applied work that we're doing uh, using machine learning. And so. One of, the, one of the big ideas animating what we're doing is that the law should be predictable. The law should be consistent. The rule of law kind of presupposes that uh, the law applies equally across uh, members of society. Every taxpayer is facing the same kind of set of tax rules. Those rules should be applied in the same way um, to every taxpayer. So a, a key part of the assumption that we're making in applying machine learning to tax law is that the the rules are kind of going to be the same for everybody. They should be applied consistently. And that a key thing that uh, tax lawyers, tax accountants, tax administration are concerned with is how is it that the tax law is going to be interpreted and applied in particular situations. And so this has a long legacy in jurisprudential thought and, and, you know, one way of, of, tracing back the, the history of this idea is back to Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. Uh, in 1897, a speech of his was reprinted in the Harvard Law Review uh, called The Path of the Law. It's a very famous article. Uh, incoming law students at the University of Toronto have to read this article. Uh, I think it's probably the same across many law schools right across North America. It's one of those you know fundamental uh, building blocks of understanding the legal system. And in that article, Holmes makes the claim that uh, what individuals really care about is how the law is going to be interpreted and applied in particular settings. How is the course of power of the state going to be brought to bear in particular instances? And so um, this is this idea that law is all about prediction. And Holmes in this article uh, has this famous quote, and I'm going to try to repeat it from memory, and I, I think I'm going to get this right. Um, he says, uh, for the rational study of law, the black letter man may be the man of the present, but the man of the future is the man of statistics and the master of economics. It's a really prophetic statement. And this is 1897. This is long before computers existed, long before, um, you know, the idea of a, of a very quick computing machine um, was, was actually popularized. But Holmes is making this claim that you know, law should boil down to math. It should be predictable. You should be able to use these tools. So we've waited, you know, 123 years now uh, to, to actually figure out how to approach this problem. So when, when we talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence in the law, what we're doing is talking about collecting the raw materials, the rulings, the cases, the legislation, um, the regs, all that information, uh, and bringing it to bear on uh, a particular problem, um, but we're synthesizing all of those materials to make a prediction about how a new situation would likely be uh, decided by uh, the courts. So how is tax law actually going to apply to this particular situation? And so 
this is a this is a very interesting idea. We're taking all these like just think about all the cases from the tax court, all the cases from the circuit courts of appeal, from the Supreme Court uh, on a particular topic, putting them together in one place, and then creating a, a model of how that legal issue operates and kind of reverse engineering that legal issue based not on um, you know interpreting using the conventional tools of statutory interpretation and trying to interpret the the words in the code but instead looking at what were the what were the facts in those cases in in those situations i've gone to court and how did the courts actually resolve those cases uh, and then accumulating all of those examples of these are the facts this is the outcome these are the facts this is the outcome accumulating them all and then backing out uh, a, an implicit model of how the courts are doing that by and large. And so it allows everybody to benefit from that resulting model of how the courts are approaching these problems uh, across a whole range of, of issues that are recurring uh, in tax. So uh, I know that's a, a bit of a long-winded answer to the, the question about what is machine learning and artificial intelligence, but really the starting point is, look, law should be predictable. We have lots of data out there in the form of rulings, in the form of judgments that we can collect as good examples of how the courts have decided these matters in the past. And we can reverse engineer using uh, machine learning methods how the courts are mapping on from you know, the facts of different situations onto outcomes. And we can do this in a really, uh, in a, in a really elegant way that leads to high quality predictions. So predictions with 90% or better accuracy about how the courts are going to make those decisions in the future, which is uh, incredibly valuable um, to taxpayers, to tax administration, uh, and, and to anyone who's looking for certainty, predictability, uh, and in fairness in the application of the law. Well, I think that was extremely helpful. I particularly like the background relating to education and students and how the, the lens of the law has changed over a century now. Um, in fact, I, I was just, you know, I'm a, a professor at uh, University of Illinois Law School, and I was sharing with my students that you and I would be speaking about artificial intelligence. And of course, they were extremely intrigued. They're clearly using tools already that have been in law schools and uh, available to uh, accounting programs for a long time now in the field of tax. And so for us to enhance that for them with the technology that you're talking about, which I, I believe is is already being implemented in, in, in some of its basic phases, uh, even in, in Google or Bing, um, but, but also in the search engines that they're using that, that are endorsed uh, in law school. And so uh, I guess that leads me to a, a question that they asked, which was, will this type of technology be available to them anytime in the near future? Right. So, and, and when they're asking that, that's, that's totally uh, a fair question. We're, we're doing a lot to uh, make this technology available um, throughout industry. And so obviously, um, if, if the students in your classes are going out into law firms, uh, law firms are increasingly you know, seeing this as one of the tools that they need to have in order to, to practice tax as effectively as possible. But we're also reaching down into academic programs and making our software available. We've also, uh, uh, announced a partnership with UC Irvine with the, the graduate tax program there. I'm really great friends with Omri Marion and Vic Fleischer and Joshua Blank uh, and others at UC Irvine. And they see in using this kind of technology uh, a, a huge boost for their graduates who are going to go into practice being familiar already with the, the leading tools to how to leverage machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, and I think UC Irvine has uh, has a few different uh, vendors that they're working with uh, of software to to help to prepare their graduates for what's what's inevitable, what's already happening uh, out in practice. Um, and it's not just law schools, and it's not just uh, the the law firms. Also, accounting programs are interested as as well. So we're dealing with uh, a number of accounting programs that are interested in exposing their students to to this kind of software and, and getting their uh, students familiarized with these new methods of conducting research. Uh, and of course, the accounting firms are also quite interested uh, in this approach too, because it has 
huge implications in terms of um, speeding up research, um, doing quality assurance, making sure that you're not missing anything, making sure, especially uh, in your early years of practice, I think any, anyone who's been in, in that experience of, uh, you know, tackling your first real life tax issue for a real client, you, you have a certain sense of, of um, earnestness about it that you, you really don't want to miss anything, uh, that you want to make sure that, you know, there's no, you know, code section that you're just kind of overlooking or there's no reg that you're, that you're not seeing or there's some aspect of the situation that you're not asking about that, that might be really uh, important for uh, the resulting opinion that you're going to, you know, be doing some of the work to prepare for. Uh, you want to make sure that you do it right. And so um, these tools can be extremely helpful for especially junior folks in, in tax law, in tax accounting to get comfortable with, okay, I'm not missing anything big. Uh, and, and here I'm getting, um, a, you know, a candidate answer to, to this situation um, that I'm researching. Uh, and it's giving me additional stuff to read to reassure myself that, that I'm really not missing anything. Um, but maybe it'd be helpful, uh, Ben, to talk a little bit about how some of these tools actually work and, and actually invert some of the conventional research um, process, right? Because this is something that we talked about um, when, we, when we had our, our conversation in DC, and I was explaining to you, actually, you know, what's characterizing these tools and what makes um, the, new, the new generation of, of tax research tools using machine learning different from some of the historical ways of of approaching this is that really kind of inverts the research process in that um, the tools are are asking the user, the tax accountant, or the tax lawyer, or the tax auditor, um, tell me the answer to a bunch of questions. It, it kind of steps you through uh, a question and answer process where you're submitting, you know, assumptions about the situation to the system, and the system's asking you uh, the the key pieces of information that it will need to produce a high quality prediction about how tax law applies to, to your client's particular situation. And so that's very different because what it's doing is it's, it's saying, okay, you tell me what, what the situation is, inform me about all these key elements. And then the system, and I'm going to anthropomorphize the system. The system is going to take all of this information, um, hold it, in its, in its memory um, and compare that to all the previously decided cases uh, and then say, okay, based on everything out there, based on you know, potentially thousands of past cases, based on the specific facts in your situation, this is the most outly, likely outcome and here's why. And like, well, let's contrast that with the current research process, which requires the, the accountant or the lawyer or the auditor to keep all that stuff in mind as they go out and they cast about for different pieces that might be relevant to that. So it's kind of like building a nest, right? You, you're, you're getting a twig here, a little piece of, of um, straw here, and you're assembling this little nest and then, you know, you're, you're building it and you're assembling it and you're saying, okay, now here's, here's the nest. Uh, like this is the finished product. Um, a lot of these research tools now though, kind of invert that and say, okay, leave it to us. We, we know what, what we need to, we, we have this checklist, we know what we need to know to give a high quality answer uh, on this tax issue that you're researching. Um, so why don't you tell us, and then you can play with it, right? So you, you, you provide all the information, you get a, the best answer based on the state of uh, the machine learning model, uh, but then you can play with different dimensions. You can swap out that assumption of fact, swap in a different assumption of fact, and see how that's likely to influence the results. So then you can do that scenario testing uh, and really get comfortable with, with how much risk there is in a particular situation. Uh, as, and as the one providing uh, an opinion or providing advice to a client, that's really reassuring. Um, so you, you might say, okay, I want to, I need to get this to 80% <laughs> uh, probability. Um, like I'm, I'm not willing to bite off more than that, or I need to get it to 70%. Or you might be like, well, I have a really risk-loving client. I, I just need to get it to 51%. I, I just need to get it to more likely than not, uh, and then we're, we're good to go. But, but it allows you to really calibrate the amount of, of risk that you're taking on depending on the risk, risk appetite of the client and, and just your comfort as the practitioner.
I really like that explanation. It, 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 uh, I, I, I'm going to have to invite you to one of my classes so that you can <laughs> explain that. I'd love, to, I'd love to do that, especially now that all the classes are online. That, that, that will be very easy to accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I know. I know. We've probably both been doing a lot of online work. I know I have for sure. Um, I, I, I like that uh, that that an inversion type of uh, uh, you know layout as uh, as opposed to kind of combing through countless cases, hoping to find the one that most resembles the question that you're asked to address for for an essay or what have you. You're you're really uh, starting off uh, with those cases in hand and figuring out how relevant they are to your client's facts. And so, I can see this being a valuable tool to uh, to to uh, just many people. Um, and, and and not only uh, through the the those providing services to clients, but also to um, government agencies and so maybe i i could ask you about that uh, uh next is just wh where do you see this impacting courts and um administrators irs uh canadian revenue agency um how 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 do you see that playing out yeah i think i think one thing that's that's been really fascinating to me is that there are early adopters everywhere. So there are early adopters in law firms. There are early adopters in small law firms, medium-sized law firms, big law firms. There are early adopters in accounting practices um, from the largest right down to the smallest. There are early adopters also in government. Like you don't normally think about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the IRS or the Canada Revenue Agency or um, you know, the Department of Justice as being this, this hotbed of early adopters of technology, but they're there. And, and folks within government are, uh, you know, not unlike folks in, in obviously in, in accounting practice or legal practice, there, there are folks there who are really keen to explore new technologies and figure out what it means for them. Uh, in my conversations with folks in government, what they say, and, and this, this is really interesting to me, and it makes complete sense, but it wasn't obvious beforehand. What I've heard is that there are um, huge returns to having government uh, discretionary decision making being more accurate uh, and more consistent and more reliable, no matter what part of the country you know that particular person exercising that discretion on behalf of the state um, or the you know the federal government, regardless of where they they happen to be operating. So different offices are naturally going to have Kind of different cultures to some extent, uh, but if you if you have uh, a consistent system that's able to replicate how that discretion is going to get exercised right across uh, the system, uh, that's actually hugely hugely valuable. Mistakes are costly. Mistakes are costly in tax administration. It means they're they're fighting battles that maybe they ought not to be fighting in some circumstances. It also means that they're not fighting battles that they ought to be fighting, and that comes at a revenue cost um, and a, at a cost to the integrity of the system as well. And so being able to anticipate how a particular tax situation would be approached and, and addressed by the court well in advance, like we're talking years in advance, uh, is actually really, really powerful for tax administration. And we, you know, the other point that I thought that on reflection makes complete sense and isn't necessarily obvious is that the, the tax administration is on the other side of every potential tax case, right? So that they have a huge use case in tax administration to use this kind of technology uh, to better understand all of the cases um, that that are potentially out there. And so to, to get that accuracy, that consistency, that reliability across the system is actually hugely valuable um, for government. And I think it's for that reason that we've seen uh, the Department of Justice in Canada adopt uh, this technology. So they were one of the there were some early adopters in the Department of Justice who pushed for this uh, up in Canada, and, and they adopted it uh, for their own uh, internal use. Of course, the Department of Justice in Canada argues all of the, the tax cases on behalf of the Canada Revenue Agency, uh, and, and, and we've seen the, the Canada Revenue Agency also piloting um, this kind of software for their own internal use, uh, and we're... we're we're having conversations with tax administrators in the U.S. Uh, as well, early conversations. Um, there are these early adopters who are super keen, uh, regardless uh, of where they happen to be, to, to explore this kind of technology because they see that it, it can allow for this you know, more accurate, uh, more consistent, more reliable 
um, technology. And also they, they do have a desire to keep up with what's happening in private practice. So it's not a comfortable position to be in if you know that um, the most sophisticated taxpayers and their counsel out there are using a particular tool. And if you don't have access to the tool, you're going to be increasingly outmaneuvered. And, and so that's not a position that if you're a tax administrator, you want to be in, you'd really like to avoid that situation, of course, as much as you possibly can, bearing in mind all the budgetary pressures and, and other pressures of, of being in tax administration. Uh, it's, a, it's a super challenging job. And then super add to that the, the technological deficit that you might find yourself in if you're not keeping up, it's, uh, it's, it's daunting. And so there is that appetite in tax administration to adopt it. Um, one thing that's funny, you asked also about courts. I think judges are uh, really reluctant to use this kind of technology. Um, at least they're worried about the perception that perhaps uh, folks will think that judges are allowing for software to substitute for their own judgment. And, and that makes a judge um, really, really nervous. And so um, at the, the Canadian Tax Foundation's uh, national conference back in, uh, I guess it was late November, uh, of last year, uh, the Chief Justice of the Tax Court of Canada got up and said, we are not using artificial intelligence uh, to decide our cases and, <laughs> and made, a big, uh, made a big point about um, you know, claiming that they're not using AI to decide their cases, uh, which I thought was really, really fascinating that, that he felt the need to, to have to get up and address the plenary session. So we're talking about thousands of people in a giant um, convention center and the, the chief justice of the tax court of Canada is getting up and announcing we are not using artificial intelligence to decide our cases. Um, I, I think it's very interesting, but you know, it could very well be a useful input into a judge's decision making, right? Um, or if I were a judge, I can imagine inviting the parties to, to use this kind of system to understand if this is a, a no-brainer case one way or the other way, that's actually really a, a great tool to encourage settlement between the parties. And so I think we're, we're increasingly seeing that phenomenon uh, where the party with the, the really strong position uh, is using this to, to support their argument. They say, don't take our word for it. You know, we, we ran it on this independent system. We entered the facts. Here are the facts that we entered in the system. Here's the resulting output. Here's the report from the system saying that we have a 95% or better chance of winning this case. Are, are you still sure you don't want to enter into terms of settlement? That's often very convincing to the other side who then, you know, run their analysis through the same system. And, and they say, okay, gosh, you know, it's, it's not nearly as strong as we thought it might be. Uh, maybe we should talk about settling this. And, and that saves, you know, the judges from having to contend with cases that, that really aren't, aren't the best use of their time because it's pretty clear how those cases should get decided. So for judges, really, I think one thing that's, that's very likely to happen is even if judges are not using this kind of technology, um, if it allows private parties uh, and the government, if they're having a, a tax dispute, to identify those cases that are easy cases and, and don't have business being in court, court, those will get settled or abandoned. Um, and then the other ones that, that are hard are the ones that are going to wind up going to court, which makes the judging process actually more challenging. This is the paradox of having these systems that can predict what's likely to happen in court. It actually becomes more difficult to predict over time because the cases that are going to court are the ones that are all the same, uh, much more challenging. So uh, that's good news if you're a tax court judge and you're, you want to have an interesting set of cases on your docket, uh, this, is, this is great news for you and you don't need to use the software, but it, it can be a useful thing to encourage uh, the warring parties to, to attend to and, and make use of. I'm not surprised to hear uh, you say that about uh, judges generally. Um, I wish they would have caveated a little bit by saying, well, we might uh, be using it, we're just not uh, you know, depending on it and reaching our conclusion. I think there's a difference there, um, which is, is, is what I'm sure people who are already using this technology are quite familiar with is that, right. uh, it helps get you uh, further faster, but in the end, you're ultimately still responsible for making that call. And so, um, 
uh, whether or not the judges themselves are using it or the, the law clerks are using it in one form or another. And, and as we discussed, there are many degrees of that. And then, of course, uh, judges, I mean, their heroes are his judges, uh, older judges, and they're reading this legalese. And, and, and uh, I, I think we mentioned about how, you know, the, the arcane uh, uh, policies that have governed law, uh, you know, have uh, there's been a large push to minimize some of that um, in the law so that uh, folks like taxpayers can actually interpret these legal opinions themselves and understand the law themselves without needing uh, to spend so much money and resources in order to do that. And so um, I think ultimately uh, the judges will realize that there's a good middle ground and they can appreciate the fact that it can help them, but yet not make the decision for them. So um I, uh, I I appreciate that point. Um, as far as uh, as far as planning goes, um, are you are you uh, envisioning that taxpayers will ultimately be able to use this for planning, uh, and their and their uh, practitioners and advising them, or uh, is this more of a prophylactic type measure that you're seeing? Yeah, so I I think absolutely this is there are already use cases in planning, uh, so. Uh, if you if you know what will make a, a proper debt instrument as opposed to you know something that might so just imagine a debt versus equity kind of concern that you may have um, one part of one dimension of planning is like okay what do, what do the terms of this financing look like in order to secure the the characterization of this of this financing that we want to get from a tax planning perspective so if you want something to be treated as a debt instrument then what do you put in place? What, what terms do you want of that financing uh, to actually make sure that it, it's going to be treated as, as a debt instrument for tax purposes? And so that's just one example of the sorts of planning uh, that you might be able to do with a system, with a system like this, even as it stands today, as, as the technology stands today. Of course, over time, um, as, you know, as different folks are reverse engineering all these different tax issues, um, and then putting them together, you can you can put together these different modules, uh, and then you can stipulate, okay, this is the kind of business result that we're hoping to achieve here. We've got this entity here and this entity here in a different geography, and what we want to do uh, is have entity A acquire entity B uh, in a tax efficient way, uh, and then you could say, okay, you know, system, can you help me figure out <laughs> exactly what what a tax efficient structure is going to look like? Um, with respect to this this um, transaction that we're contemplating, I can easily imagine a system being trained on uh, various materials to accomplish that in a in a tax efficient way. Um, I'm not aware of a system that will do that today elegantly, but I I do know that the building blocks are being assembled right now, um, and in, increasingly it's it's happening using machine learning uh, that will facilitate that. Um, in in the not so distant future, so I, I would expect that to be, um, you know, available. And it, it would be impossible for me to give you a precise date, but it, but I don't think it's that far off. I think it will be um, in the course of our careers uh, that that this sort of technology becomes kind of widely available and understood. And and this is just another part of the the toolkit of of the tax planner. Um, this is how you this is how you put together uh, a tax plan for a, a big transaction. Of course, it's it, there's a science to it, um, but there's also an art to it, and that's not going to change either. Um, but to the extent that we can automate uh, the investigation of a whole bunch of different potential alternative uh, structures for a transaction to get it done efficiently, which I which I take is really you know one of the 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 key. Um, the key activities in tax planning. I think absolutely we're going to be able to see um, machine learning technology play a role there. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll turn the tables on you, but I'll, I'll base it on um, some comments that you made during our, our, our lunch in, in DC. As an educator, you told me that your focus is, is largely on making sure that information is disseminated properly to, to all taxpayers and, and, yeah. and, and those. And so uh, we're focused uh, in the last uh, set 
question on tax planning and the more sophisticated end of, of things. But um, how about how about the flip side of the coin? Those those who are on the lower uh, income end of the spectrum, um, you know, to your prior point that you made with respect to just making sure that uh, information is getting uh, you know shared. Yeah. So so exactly. I, I made the point earlier about certainty, predictability, and fairness coming out of the application of machine learning to the tax system. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worried that the, the more sophisticated, well-heeled taxpayers will find their way to, to the best technology to uh, inform the, the tax decisions that they're making. Uh, where I am worried and where uh, I think we can make a, a big contribution is, is in helping uh, low-income taxpayers uh, with making this technology available to them to help inform their decisions and, and how the results that they get uh, in their interactions uh, with you know, the IRS. And so one of the things that, that we've been doing uh, is dealing with early adopters. I mentioned early adopters um, earlier in the conversation. There are early adopters at these low-income taxpayer clinics right across the country who are interested in using technology to allow them to give faster uh, advice to the low-income taxpayers who are being helped by those clinics. And so uh, we are rolling out our technology on a pro bono basis to all of these low income taxpayer clinics right across the country. We're starting with a, a smaller number of those clinics where we've got early adopters who have kind of self identified as early adopters and are, are and are keen to put it to use. And, and so the early returns are really exciting. Folks uh, understand um, increasingly how to use the software, how it can materially assist uh, their clientele, uh, and so the the goal is to to learn from those early adopters and to to figure out how to position the software to help as much as possible um, other clinics where maybe we don't have early adopters present, uh, but but who could still genuinely really benefit from this. So we're we're developing the playbook about how to roll it out, identify the context where it can really be most helpful uh, in those situations, and getting ideas about new things that, that we can develop that would be of particular utility in the low-income taxpayer clinic world. Uh, so th there, there will be a different need for a, a different set of tax issues to be uh, reverse engineered in that context than in the, in the high-end tax planning world. Um, at least to some extent, those things don't perfectly overlap with each other. Yeah, and, and I can only see that being even uh, more valuable um with recent legislation i know we've we've had the cares act and and some other uh legislation in the u.s that are uh targeting low-income taxpayers and and helping out uh struggling businesses and i think that's going on uh all across the world um and so uh i'm sure you're seeing it in canada i believe i've, I've read a few pieces about canada implementing some uh you know some rules in this in this area so i can only imagine uh it'll be it'll be highly valuable to them um i'll uh, i'll close by asking you if uh if there's any additional information or insights that you'd like to share with our listeners uh about this area of of the law and technology uh i th i think what i would do is invite folks to visit uh the company's website if they are interested we have a bunch of informational content on the website um, we're publishing uh pieces in tax notes so have an eye in tax notes for for things on artificial intelligence and tax. I think we have a piece coming out, Ben, shortly on debt versus equity classification that's, that's gonna be coming out in tax notes. So that's something that folks can look for. Um, we've got a lot of similar content uh, on our website. It's bluejlegal.com. Uh, or if you, if you want the shorter version, if you just go to blue and then the letter j.com, B-L-U-E-J.com, uh, you, can, you can find a lot of those informational resources um, that are there. Uh, uh, and, and totally accessible and complimentary. Uh, and I think you can also sign up to try out the technology there if you, if you have an interest uh, and submit your information, you can get a trial account uh, set up and you can, you can play with it and, and see how it might be able to, to help you in your practice or just satiate your curiosity if you're really curious about this. Awesome. Well, that's really great. I appreciate you coming on the uh, show. Uh, this uh, video edition of uh, Willis Ways In. Um, it's been great talking with you just like last time. And hopefully, whether it's uh, here in front of Tax Notes listeners or maybe each other's classes uh, or, or, or just catching up over the phone, uh, I look forward to our next discussion.
Thanks, Ben. And, and again, happy birthday. Thank you very much. I appreciate <laughs> that. 